The section of God's word that we'll give our attention to this morning it was our second lesson, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Uh, for our purposes now, we'll hear again verses 3, 4, and 5 of that text where it's written, uh, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And this is God's word. So friends, since it's Memorial Day, uh, I'd like you to think about what comes to your mind when you hear the word freedom. Maybe like in the picture, you, a picture of a bald eagle, maybe not perched, but flying through the air, you know, wings stretched out, uh, nothing to stop it from doing what it wants to do. Maybe you think of an American flag, you know, stars and stripes blowing in the wind. Uh, maybe if you're a historian, you think about uh, 100, 150 years ago in our nation's history, uh, a former slave having been set free, and now that slave can, can go, they can live where they want to live, they can do what they want to do. Maybe when you think of freedom, you think of some of the special privileges that we have in America that lots of other people in the world don't have. The freedom to be able to travel basically wherever we want in the whole world, as long as we can afford the plane ticket. Maybe it's the freedom to be able to uh, speak uh, criticism about our government's decisions or our government's actions or their inactions. Maybe it's the freedom to be able to choose those who will serve in our government. Freedom encompasses many different uh, pictures, many different facets of life. But if you look at freedom in our world, one thing that you'll see is that that freedom is often limited in one way or another. Or that freedom is even abused by those who want to use it to try and gather up power for themselves, gather up money for themselves, or influence and control. And that freedom is even despised by those whose power it threatens. But today, beginning today, we're going to look at a different kind of freedom. Uh, the freedom that God speaks of in the Bible. It's a freedom that only God can give us. And it's a freedom that he does give us through Jesus Christ. It's a freedom from sin, a freedom from death, and a freedom to live eternally. And what happened in Galatia was there were these Christians in these cities that they were in danger of turning away from that freedom. They were in danger of losing that freedom and, and going back to a form of of slavery. Now exactly how they were doing that we'll see over the next several Sundays as we continue to work through the letter to the Galatians. But today as we look at the opening section of this, of this book, what we'll see is the beauty of that freedom and also the uniqueness of that freedom. A little bit of background as we begin. Uh, Galatia was a region where Paul himself had traveled uh, about a year or two probably prior to writing this letter. It was a region when he traveled through it, he started churches in several of the leading cities of that region. You can see them up here on, uh, on the map. Well, apparently what had happened was he had traveled through these cities and left and then other people had come through and were teaching a different message that we'll speak about later. And that was what prompted his writing to them. And so he opens his letter to these Christians in Galatia with a very simple greeting saying, grace and peace to you. A fitting greeting for Paul to use, uh, particularly to a Christian audience, because those two words, grace and peace, they really uh, encompass the Christian faith and the Christian message. Grace is God's undeserved love for us. Peace is uh, what we have as, as a result of God's grace. When we know God's grace, we have peace. We have peace with him. We have peace in our conscience. We have peace in our heart. But both of these words together, when Paul uses them, he, he means not just to use a Hebrew greeting, not just to use a Greek greeting, but to put them together and to give us the fullest sense of those words, grace and peace. Well, where does real grace and peace come from? It comes from, as our text says, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And there in that verse, uh, we have a, uh, a neat, simple summary, and we have really the heart and the beauty of the freedom that's ours in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to look through this word by word, phrase by phrase, but one thing that we'll see is that it is entirely God's work from start to finish, all right? So the first thing that we see is that what Jesus did. Jesus gave himself. That is, he, he gave up his life for us. His life wasn't taken from him. But he offered it, and he offered it willingly. And, and why did he offer his life willingly? The next phrase answers, it was for our sins. 
Now, there's a little nuance in the Greek language that doesn't come through in, in any English translation. It has to do with the word for. Uh, why did Jesus die? What happened when he died? I mean, it wasn't just because of our sin, but it was that actually our sin was placed upon him. There was an exchange that took place. The sin, became, sin came off of us, was placed on him, and that was why he died. He died because all of our sin was put upon him. And then what was that to accomplish? His dying for our sins, it, it accomplished a rescue. It was done to rescue us. That word rescue, it's a dramatic word, and it's also a telling word because it implies a, a state of helplessness on the part of the person who's being rescued. You know, what kind of a person needs rescue? Someone who can't help themselves. Someone who can't save themselves. Now think of a person drowning in a river. What does that person need? They need rescue, right? What good is it going to do if I were to toss that person a copy of Swimming for Dummies and say, here you go, learn how to swim? I'm not going to do any good at all. What they need is a rope, right? They need rescue. They need someone to pull them out of the water. Well, that's what God does for us in Jesus Christ. He pulls us out of our sins. So Jesus isn't a teacher. He's our hero. He's our rescuer. And the next thing, what were we rescued from? We were rescued from the present evil age. Now, Jewish thinkers, they divide all of history into two eras. There is the present evil age, which is the world in which we live, which is marked and marred by sin and death. And then there is the age to come, which is the coming kingdom of God, when everything is restored to perfection and righteousness and wholeness once again. And so what Jesus does is he rescues us from this sinful world and from the destruction that the sinful world is earning. And then finally, why does this all happen? It all happens according to the will of our God and Father, that all of this from start to finish happened simply because God wanted it to, not because we'd earned it, not because we deserved it, simply out of his grace. So the beauty of our freedom is that we're free from sin and death forever. That this freedom is entirely God's work from start to finish, and he did all of it entirely out of his love for us. And so what all this gives us is certainty. Certainty that God's deliverance is real and it's accomplished, that I have no reason to doubt it. I also don't have to worry that worry whether or not I've done enough to, to merit or to deserve God's Rescue because he did it without any consideration of my merit or lack thereof. He does it all for us, and we simply, by faith, enjoy the benefits, the fruit of his work. So with all that in mind, I'd like you to think, have you ever received a gift that just blew you away? You know, where, where you looked at the gift and just said, wow, you did that for me? I remember one summer when I was working my way through school, um, some coworkers of mine at this place caught wind that it was my birthday, and they decided to have a little surprise party in the break room when our shift was almost done. They had gotten a cake. They had called in everyone to sing happy birthday, and of course they did it all without me noticing, which maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not. It depends on how well you know me. Um, now maybe they just wanted to get a cake, but I was just blown away that these people, they were just coworkers. They weren't my close friends. They weren't my family, yet they wanted to do this special thing for me. Wow, you did that for me? And so I, what I want you to think about today is, do you ever look at Jesus' work like that? That's the ultimate gift, isn't it? Everything that he did from start to finish, coming from heaven to earth, suffering on a cross, dying for your sin, rising in, and he did it all so that you could live forever. Do you ever stop and look at what Jesus did and say, wow, Jesus did that. He did all of that for me. If it were a painting, could you just sit and stare at it for hours because you're just captivated by its beauty? See, we should really be blown away every time we think about what Jesus did. Because it is great. I mean, that God would become a person and actually die for us so that we could live forever. That's what the song we just sang was all about. But I think what happens is that many times we just don't stop. We just don't allow our time, we don't allow ourselves the time to reflect upon the magnitude of what Jesus did for us. And that leads to it only having a superficial impact on us, if any at all. And so based on that, I would say that if, if you don't have a desire to be in worship as, as often as you possibly can, or that studying according to God's will just feels like this immense burden to you, or, or studying and learning from the Bible just feels tedious and boring, probably haven't stopped to think about the beauty of your freedom in Jesus long enough or often enough. You see, God rescued you because he loves you. 
That rescue is complete, it's done, it's accomplished, there's nothing left to do, there's no uncertainty in it at all, and he did it even though he knew he probably wouldn't be instantly excited about it. Yet he did it anyway, and that's what makes what God did for us in Jesus so beautiful. And what makes it beautiful makes it at the very same time unique. You see, every other religion in the world in some way says something like this. Here's what you need to do if you want to live forever. Here's what you need to do if you want to be right with God or if you want to you know, please the, the, the divine powers, whoever they are. Here's what you need to do now. Get busy. Go do it. Get at it. But Christianity, the Bible makes no such demand of us. Actually, quite the opposite. Martin Luther uh, wrote a commentary on the book of Galatians and in the preface to that commentary, uh, he writes this. He says, Uh, Then we do nothing and work nothing in order to obtain it. You know, talking about this freedom, I reply, nothing at all. This righteousness means to do nothing, but to know and believe only this, that Jesus Christ has been made for us wisdom, righteousness, and redemption from God. See, what Christianity says is that it's all right here, that God has done every last bit of it for you in Jesus Christ, and there's nothing left for you to do because Jesus has done it all. And that's why Paul opens the second part of this section by saying that he is astonished. Why is he astonished? He says, so quickly you're deserting the one who called you in grace and are turning to a different gospel. Here's where knowing the historical context helps us to fill in. See, uh, they lived at a time when many Christians were also Jewish, which meant that they were brought up living under uh, laws that governed what they ate that governed the way they worshipped and that even governed what happened to little boys about eight days after they were born. But see, the Christians who weren't raised as Jews, they weren't raised under any of those customs. And so these churches in Galatia that, that Paul's writing to, they were a mix. They were a mix of people who were brought up with Jewish laws and customs and people who weren't. And so what had happened was that sometime after Paul had left, Paul had left these churches and gone on to start other ones in new cities, that a group of people had come into these cities and into these churches and told, in particular, the new non-Jewish Christians that if they really wanted to be children of God, yeah, Jesus is good, but what you really need to do is to follow all the Jewish laws and all the Jewish customs. And so this other gospel that they were turning to, it was faith in Jesus Christ plus the observance of the Jewish laws and customs. What does Paul say about such a gospel? He says that it's really no gospel at all. And then he actually strengthens that statement saying, if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Paul's point there, while harsh, is quite simple. It's that right doctrine, that right teaching matters. And that it's a matter of eternal importance. You see, if we change the gospel at all, if we add anything to it or we take anything away from it, it stops being the gospel. You see, good or gospel means good news. Uh, And then, therefore, when any kind of work is added to it, it's no longer good news, but it turns into a a to-do list or a task list. And so good news of Jesus Christ, by definition, it excludes any kind of of additional works. It cannot be grace plus something. It cannot be faith in Christ plus something. And that's the uniqueness of our gospel freedom in Christ. We do nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it, but if it's one of a kind and it's free, and here's why it has to be that way. See, the minute you add something to the gospel, the minute you add something to God's grace in Jesus Christ, Where does your confidence for your relationship to God in eternity go? It automatically goes to that thing that you added, no matter how great or how small it is. Uh, What you say in your mind becomes something like this. It no longer is, I'm a child of God because Jesus died for me and rose again. What it instead becomes is, I'm a child of God because I have done this or I do this or I don't do that instead. You see, our human nature is always going to want to find that something that plus to add to God's grace. For some people, it easily becomes grace plus conformity to tradition or conformity to culture. You're not a real Christian unless you think like us, talk like us, act like us, and like the same kind of music as we do. This happens when we insist that there's only one right way to dress for church, one right style of language to use in Bible translation and church publication, or, or one right musical setting for worship. What happens when we hold these attitudes is that we end up 
looking down upon others who don't measure up to our expectation, but we forget that our expectation didn't come from God. Our expectation was just the result of human tradition. So I'm asking all of you to think, is that me? Am I adding a demand to somebody conform to tradition or conform to my culture to be a so-called real Christian? For others, it more easily becomes grace plus good behavior or grace plus tolerance. In other words, saying, if you want to be a part of our group, well, the first thing you've got to do is clean up your life. Or if you want to be a part of our group, you've got to be more tolerant than you've been. So again, I ask, could this be you? Reflecting on all of that, I want you to think about what the result is any time that we add something to God's grace. What happened among these Christians in Galatia? It says that they were thrown into confusion. And that's the same thing that happens still today. Anytime we add to God's grace, souls are thrown into confusion. Think about this for a moment. How many people in America, how many people in the United States alone stay away from church for a reason that has absolutely nothing to do with God's word, but instead has to do with customs and traditions that have been added onto it? It's a scary number, I think. I don't know the count, but I'm guessing it's in the millions. And so we, as children of God, let it never be said of us that we added extra rules, extra conditions to the gospel, and in doing so nullified it in our teaching and in our preaching. Let it never be said of us that we were the ones who threw souls into confusion by adding on to God's grace. But yet, even looking at all of that, God's grace is so great and it's so magnificent that it is sufficient to cover over And it's sufficient to forgive all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, including the times that we have, whether consciously or not, taught a form of grace plus something else. See, those sins too, they were counted among all the sins of the whole world that Jesus died for when he died on the cross. And by his death and his resurrection, Jesus has given us freedom from sin, freedom from its consequences. It's a freedom that's beautiful because it's entirely God's work and therefore it's complete and therefore it's perfect. And it's a freedom that's unique because it comes to us only, only by God's grace. And so friends, today as we go, uh, let's first of all confess the times. Let's confess the times that we've failed uh, to marvel and to wonder at what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Let's also confess the times that we have, knowingly or not, added extra requirements onto the gospel of Jesus. But then let's praise him that our rescue in Jesus, uh, the rescue that he's worked for us is absolutely complete, that our sins are 100% forgiven and that there is nothing left for us to do, that those sins are completely forgiven and they're wiped away in Jesus Christ. And then finally, let's pray. Pray that God keep us faithful to his word, that he lead us back into that word again and again and again so that we can be certain that we are not adding to it and that we are not taking away from it. Pray that he keep us safe and secure in the freedom that Jesus won for us. Amen.